Well, we have come to the end of our series on Elijah. I know. Um, so I'm finishing off the series this morning, just doing a little bit of a recap. And um, I think, I, as I was looking at it again, just looking at final bits this morning, I felt there was a really, uh, there was something I really felt God wanted to say. So I'm going to share that in a moment. Um, but if you remember, we've been looking at this story of this prophet of Israel. And remember, Elijah lived in a time when things weren't going so good for Israel. The people of God weren't really following God in the way that they were called to. And um, Elijah was a prophet who spoke into that situation, who God called to come and bring truth of who God is into that situation. Not an easy one to do that in. If you've ever been someone who's uh, stood up for something in a room full of people who maybe think differently, you'll know how hard it is to do that. Elijah was someone who did that to a nation and to kings and who brought the word of God, brought the challenge of God to kings and people who were not doing as they were called to be, not being the people of God, not being the light to the nations that God had called them to be. So we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 to 21. And today it's all about Elijah passing on the mantle. You know, we have that phrase, passing on the mantle. It comes from it, this. It comes from this passage where Elijah, who has been called by God, who has done all these things for God, God then calls him to pass on the baton to anoint Elijah, Elisha to carry on being a prophet to the people of God. So 1 Kings 19, just a few verses, 19 to 21. If you remember, Elijah had just been hiding. Zach did a great sermon last week. I would encourage you to uh, go back to the channel, YouTube channel and, and watch it, um, where Elijah was in this place of doubt. Who am I? What's happening, God? I feel like I'm on my own. I've been zealous for you, but things aren't going right. And in that place, God speaks to him and says, go and find Elisha and anoint him. So from verse 19, so Elijah went from there, from the place that he was hiding and where God had spoken to him. He went from there and he found Elisha, son of Shaphat, he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come to you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. That would have been some celebration, eh? It's a lot of meat there. <laughs> a lot of burgers over the barbecue that he was celebrating. And this, 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 this headline of passing on the mantle of investing in the next generation, the next group of people. This is what Elijah was doing. He'd been used by God mightily. He'd had his real doubts and his ups and downs, and now God was calling him to pass on the mantle. Just a quick recap. Remember, he'd um, just recently reappeared from um, three years of hiding. He'd, he'd been doing all this, um, challenging the kings, saying, "You sh remember the people of God were worshipping other gods other than God. Um, they'd forgotten their calling as a people of God to be a devoted people to God, to be set apart, to be a light to the nations. And they were being led by kings who increasingly were corrupt and who compromised in their own devotion to God. It was not a good time. Elijah had confronted King Ahab about this and prophesied that there would be a drought in the land. And then Elijah had gone into hiding, as you would. <laughs> you say that to a king, you run and you hide. And he'd recently appeared, reappeared from these three years of hiding. He'd confronted the prophets of Baal. Remember that story of him confronting the prophets of Baal, calling down the fire of God 
to, to show that God is the true God. And the prophets of Baal weren't able to do anything. And Baal didn't show up. He prays for fire to come down out of heaven to testify to the truth of God. And then following that, the false prophets are destroyed and rain falls in response to Elijah's prayers. And then, however, Queen Jezebel, the wife of Ahab, gets very cross about this and pursues Elijah and promises to kill him. So Elijah runs again, overcome with fear. Just seen God do this amazing thing. But he's overcome with fear. I find that quite comforting, that he's normal and he's real. And he seemingly loses all confidence in God to protect him. And he runs terrified into the desert. And eventually God appears to Elijah at Mount Horeb, which is what we looked at last week with Zach. Not in fire, not in earthquake, but in a still, small voice God speaks to him. And Elijah twice complains to God in this place that he is the only one faithful to God in Israel. And he's apparently worried that God's word is not bearing fruit in the land. And God replies to Elijah, revealing that there are 7,000 loyal followers of God besides him. And then in this moment of self-doubt, in this moment of what is happening, God, God calls Elijah, appoints him to go and anoint Elijah, Elisha and call him to ministry. Elijah was the appointed prophet for the people of God. He had the job of speaking the truth about God to the people of God and particularly to the rulers. This was his job. And God was now asking him to pass on this authority to Elisha, to raise up Elisha, to be able to take on his role and to learn from him. And to his credit, Elijah responds. Elijah goes. And he goes and finds Elisha, who is busy plowing fields. And he throws his cloak over him, a symbol of passing on the authority, of passing on the anointing of God to Elisha. In his scaredness, in that place of being scared and despondent, he responds to God in a good way. He's been in this place where he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and put your prophets to death. This is verse 14. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. This was the context for Elijah's response to God to go to Elisha. And I felt this morning that that was a real word for some of us how many of us have felt like that especially if you've been around for a while as a follower of Jesus or you've been in the church for a while we followed and served God over the years yet around us we see people rejecting God not only that but we see that people that call themselves followers of Jesus compromising giving up their faith we see the church around us struggling. It's a similar situation to Elijah found himself in. What is going on, Lord? Am I the only one left? We may even have said something like the words Elijah said. I've followed you, God. I've been faithful. What is happening? I feel like I'm the only one left. And in that place, God speaks and he tells Elijah that he still has many people in the land who are faithful to him. And he calls Elijah to take his eyes off himself. And he gives him a new assignment to raise up the next generation in Elisha. He calls Elijah to take his eyes off himself and to look to God who is sovereign we sometimes see things in our own little circle, in our own little perspective, but God is bigger than that. And God is doing something that we don't always see, but our call is to focus on him, to trust him, to put our hand in his, and to let him lead us to the place he wants to lead us to. There are many people today who need to hear that God is God 
that he has a plan, that he has faithful people in the land, and that your job, our job, is to take our eyes off ourselves and to listen to the voice of God calling us to the next assignment, even though it seems tough and hard. And I really do believe at the moment in the church in the West, there is a shaking of the church. There is. I don't think you can look at what is happening in the church in the West and not say there isn't a shaking of the church. We're a little bit like Elijah's in this moment. We've got, an, an, we've got a choice. God, what are you doing? What's happening? Are we the only ones left? Or... We look to him, we take our eyes off ourselves, and we look to him, and we trust him as a faithful God that he is doing something in his church that will bear fruit down the line. And we have a choice to join in with him in this or not. And I think that what he is doing is he's calling the church back to holiness. He's calling it back to be the light to the nations, to represent who Jesus is in the world, And I think it's the beginning of something new for the church, this place we're in at the moment. I'm not just talking about Philadelphia, I'm talking about the church. But it is a place of shaking. It's not an easy place to be. Some of the news headlines aren't easy to read. But in this place, we have a choice to focus on him and to hear the voice of the Lord, the still small voice of God speaking into this place, saying, here is what I want you to do as a people of God. There are many people that you can't see that are my faithful followers. Look what I will do. Do you want to be part of this new assignment? It's okay to be like Elijah, to have the emotions he had, to not be sorted, to have doubts and fears. But the call today is to respond like Elijah to the voice of God saying, I am not finished yet. I am not finished with you yet. Hear my voice speaking to you in this time of shaking. I have people in the land who are faithful to me, and I'm calling you to do the same. I think that is what God is saying to his church at the moment. He's calling us back to holiness. That isn't a self-righteousness. That is a Holiness is a people who know their need of God, who are desperate for God to move, who are on their knees um, asking for mercy and forgiveness and seeking him to be the one who is glorified, seeking him again above all else. That's what holiness is. It's not a self-righteousness. It's actually a desperate recognition of our need for God and for him to do something. And that is what he's calling us to as the church in the West. And he's calling us, I think, as the people of God here at Philadelphia and in Network Church Sheffield. So, this morning, are you prepared to step into the shoes of Elijah? I did a lot of research. I found the exact shoes that Elijah wore. (laughs) You doubt my credentials here? (laughs) Yeah, he was very, very forward in fashion, was Elijah. Um, Are you prepared to step into the shoes of Elijah? And that is a particular word I felt I wanted to say this morning. And I really feel the challenge um, for me and for us as a church. Are we prepared to, in the place of shaking, to respond to the voice of God saying, come, there's a new thing I'm doing. Because the new thing means leaving behind stuff. Elijah had to leave behind who he was as a prophet. He was the one who spoke to the people of God. He was the one who spoke to Israel. It was his calling. But God was saying, no, I want you to now pass that on to someone else. You need to invest into someone else. So there was a, there was a losing of something for Elijah in this. What are we called to leave behind in order to step into the new thing of God? What are you called to leave behind in order to do that? Now, I want to speak more generally to us all now from the passage. and Just look in, delve into a little bit what it means to be like Elijah. And also what it means to be like Elisha. We don't live in times when, like in the Old Testament, there was one person who was the one called by God to speak the truth There were a few prophets, but often there seemed to be these key figures who who spoke the word of God to the nations. 
these days, the church is the prophetic voice that speaks into things. So we all together are a bit like Elijah. We're called to carry that calling. And within the body of Christ, we can all operate prophetically by speaking the truth of God. There are certain people within the body of Christ who are more gifted as prophets, and their job is to enable the prophetic throughout the whole of the body of Christ. But we are all called to be like Elijah, speaking truth into power, speaking the truth of who God is, speaking the truth of what he stands for in a world that needs to see this, that needs to know this. So don't think of one person, think of the church as being the prophetic call, the, the ones that are called to be prophetically speaking into. And not just, it's not just about speaking, it's about living a life that, that reflects the things of God. And one of the key messages in the passage, as we see how Elijah is called to pass on the mantle to Elisha, is that we enable each other to step into what God is calling us to. So if you like, we are sometimes Elijah to us as Elishas. We are enable the stepping in of the new thing as the people of God. And we all at some point in our walk with Jesus will be like Elijah, or we should be. And we all at some point in our walk with Jesus will be like Elisha, or we should be. Prepared to have someone invest their lives into us just as we are called to be like Elijah and invest into the lives of others. Sometimes we inhabit the shoes of Elijah and God uses us to invest in others. Sometimes we inhabit the shoes of Elisha and we are the ones being invested in. God's plan is to raise people up who raise people up. We sometimes have used in this church a phrase, disciples who make disciples. That's just people who, call, who help, help each other follow Jesus. I'm never going to make disciples of me. That is never what we're called to do. My job in terms of making disciples of disciples is to help people become followers of Jesus. That's what that phrase means. At some point in our walk with Jesus, we are like Elijah, as I say. We have a particular calling. We have a role in the body. We have things that we do. We pray. We teach. We bless others. We serve we have life experience that we share as we speak into others' lives and we help them to step into their calling. All of us in the church can do this. This isn't just the job of people who stand at the front or people who call themselves leaders. The body of Christ together are like Elijah, speaking into the lives of others. And every one of you in this room will have something that you can speak into the life of someone else. Regardless of how you feel about your walk with God, because look, remember Elijah and how he felt. Remember the doubts that he had. Remember how he worried about what God was doing, but yet God still chose to use him. So that is one of the lies that sometimes we believe, that we have to be a certain level of Christian, a certain, uh, be in a certain place to be able to be used by God. That is a lie. That isn't true. In fact, God is looking for authentic people who struggle, who have doubts, who find following Jesus hard but are real in that and still choose to focus on him. That's the qualification of being in Elijah. And then you have something to share. Then I have something to share. And look what God will do with your experience and your gifts and your skills as you choose to step out and speak into people's lives. And at some point in our walk with Jesus, we are like Elijah. We look to others to help us to follow Jesus. We listen for his voice. We humble ourselves. There's a humility in being in Elisha. In saying, I need to humble myself. I need to hear from you. I haven't got it right. I haven't got it all sorted. There's a humility that's needed as we allow God to use other people to speak into our lives. Sometimes it's other people we don't want to be speaking into our lives, but God, they bring some wisdom, and we're like, God, why did you use that person to bring wisdom? I don't want it to be that person. Sometimes it's a child. Often it's a child. I came to know the Holy Spirit through children praying for me. I'd never, had, I'd never experienced prayers like that before. I've told you this when I was at Spring Harvest and I was a steward and the person leading, I was stewarding the children's work and the person leading the children's work said, there's a steward at the back who needs prayer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Go and pray for him. There'd be a few, <laughs> and, and these children kind of zoned in on me and started praying for me that I would receive the Holy Spirit. 
I had to be a little bit humble there. <laughs> what, children? God, you can't do this through them. But they did. He did. There's a, there's a humility to being an Elisha. And often we will be Elijah and Elisha's at the same time in our walk with Jesus. It's not that we kind of are Elijah and then we become Elisha's or the other way around. It's that, that we will be both. We will inhabit the shoes of both at the same time often. Sometimes we'll be looking to people. There'll be people investing into our lives. Other times we'll be investing into the lives of others. But I would suggest that as we come to the later stages of life or faith, we will increasingly find ourselves called to be like Elijah. As we have read in this passage, called to pass on the baton, to invest into the lives of those stepping into the calling at the early stages of their faith, in journey, their faith journey. And the problems come in the church when we refuse to wear the shoes of Elijah or Elisha correctly. When we have a calling, when we have a particular th way of doing things, and we refuse to do the fullness of what it means to be Elijah and to invest into others, and sometimes to step away from what we do in order to let others be able to do what God is calling them to do. That's hard, to step away from something that you have done for a while. Because like it or not, we still do get our identity from what we do. And it sometimes reveals how much we have got our identity in the things that we do as we're asked to step aside from it. Or in Elijah's shoes, when we don't look to be invested in or to learn from others, maybe there's a pride there. I don't need this. I'm okay. Or there's a, I just don't know, you just, we just don't give the time to spend time with people who we know will sharpen us and help us to step into the thing that God is calling us to do. If you think about it, though, throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, this is what happens. Jesus calls his disciples. It's a bit like the story from today when he goes and calls his disciples by the lake, come and follow me. You know, Elijah goes to Elisha, throws the mantle over him, throws the cloak over him, and Elisha follows and in the same way, Jesus went to the disciples, didn't he? And said, come and follow me. And they leave everything behind to do so. They are re responsive to him. They're prepared to leave things behind and go after him. And they gradually learn from him. And gradually, Jesus inhabits the shoes of Elijah and enables them to step into the things that Jesus does. Now, if anyone had the qualification to say, now I'm going to carry on doing this ministry, Jesus did didn't he? He could have carried on just doing it, but he didn't. He stepped aside. He trained up his disciples, and they became people who did the job, and he stepped aside from it. And they then became people who were Elijah's to others and spoke into other people's lives. And that is how the church of God grows. For some reason, God chooses to step aside and allow us to be the ones who are the witness to, witnesses to who he is and the witnesses to his kingdom. Because there's something in the doing, in the going, that means that we become all that we're called to be. And we learn who God is as we go and as we allow ourselves to be invested in. Think about Paul. He's like Elisha after his encounter with God on the Damascus Road. He goes to the, and straight after, he goes to the house of Ananias and he learns from him and the believers there. And he spends time with them. He spends three years studying and learning, no doubt living life with other believers, seeing what it means firsthand for them to walk with Jesus. He's like Elisha being invested into. And then he goes out and, uh, and carries on his ministry and speaks and preaches. And then he becomes Elijah to Timothy, who is like the Elisha. And he raises up Timothy and invests into Timothy. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul says this about Timothy. Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord, he will remind you of my way of life. He can, Timothy can only do that if he's lived with Paul and seen his way of life. Timothy will remind you of my way of life. Paul has been like Elijah to Timothy, and Timothy has learned. And then Timothy becomes a leader within the church and does the same. We see in the two letters we have of Paul to Timothy how he sought to pass on all that he knew. The church of God needs people who behave like Elijah and people who behave like Elisha. And throughout our lives at different times, 
we will need to inhabit both roles. What is God inviting you to inhabit this morning? What, how will it, what does it look like for you to inhabit the roles of Elijah this morning? What does it look like for you to inhabit the shoes of Elisha this morning? Should we just go to the next slide? Dom, please. What does it mean to be like Elijah? He listens and he obeys, and he's willing to let go. 1 Kings 19, 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. He was hiding away. He was doubting. He was struggling, but he was listening. He was able to hear the voice of God. So, What it means to be like Elijah is not to be all sorted, not to be all okay, not to not have doubts. It means that you are listening for the voice of God. That's what it means to be like Elijah. And it's okay listening, but then when he speaks, it means that you are someone who obeys. What's he saying? What are you going to do about it? What is God saying to you about being an Elijah? However you're feeling, whatever is going on in your life, he will use you if you are someone who is prepared to listen to his voice and obey him. What is he saying? The key posture for qualification for growing in maturity is not knowledge or having everything sorted or having 100% faith in the time. It is a posture of listening and being prepared to obey the voice of God. Do you do all that you can to hear what God might be saying? To be in the place of encounter, reading the Bible. Zach said something that really challenged me last week. He said, don't say that God doesn't speak to you if you don't read the Bible. (laughs) It's true. It's the main place that God will speak to us. But are we wanting to hear his voice so that we know where he is calling us to go? He listened and he obeyed, and he went and anointed Elisha. And he was willing to let go of what he was doing at the moment. He had done this role for so long, and he was willing to let go of his own claim to ministry. And you and I, as I've said, will sometimes need to step aside and to help others to do the stuff. And I'm particularly speaking, again, to people who have been walking with Jesus for a while. You are so important in the church. Mentors, disciples, people who share what God has done. And I think there might be some people in this church today who think, maybe God's finished with me. I've done my bit. That is not true. Paul says in, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 14, I can't remember. He says, there are, you have many guardians, but you don't have no spiritual fathers. And I'd add mothers there as well. The church needs spiritual fathers and mothers, people who step up and, and, and share what God has been doing in their lives into the lives of others. Where might God be asking you to use your experience, what you know, to encourage and invest in someone else? Elijah called Elisha, and most scholars think that he spent six years with Elisha, shadow, Elijah shadowing Elijah and learning from him before Elisha fully took on the role of Elijah and Elijah was taken off to heaven. Jesus called the disciples and he lived life with them, doing the stuff, sending them out. I like to think of Jesus sitting around a campfire with the disciples as they came back, debriefing. Oh, what happened? Why didn't this work? He lived life with them. He modeled it to them. Investing in them. I, one of the things I loved, the team laugh at me because I, for a while I was going, when I was in Israel, but now, it's, when I was in Albania, I was reminded of something that happened in Israel. No, I'm joking. Um, 
the, one of the things that I loved in Albania, that we, uh, we went on a mission trip, we joined in with YWAM a couple of weeks ago, over October half term, 16 of our youth went, it was a fantastic time. And I just, just show the next picture please, Dom. Um, this is some of our young people. Um, sit, and I love this image because one of the, one of the things that all, all of them said was they loved being in the community at the YWAM base, Youth with a Mission. These are people who've given up their, a, a year of their lives to do mission in a particular country. This happened to be in Albania. And our young people, we all got to just join in with them for a week, but we fitted into the community. And one of the things that, that all the young people said was they loved joining in the community. They loved being in that environment of the community of YWAM. And um, being amongst people who had given their lives to Jesus for a year, and there was that, there was that kind of atmosphere of faith. It was contagious. And I, one of the things I loved doing was just stepping back and sitting and watching our young people talking with some of the Y1 people who were just a little bit older than them as the, and asking them questions and being invested into. And you could see our young people come alive as they were spoken to, as, as, as they saw these people following Jesus. That's being Elijah and Elisha. That's the environment that we, we need to have within the church, where we're, we've, we, we, we invest in each other, where we, we, we have those spaces where we're able to live life together. Now, I know that's a, a particularly unique situation that isn't normal life, but we can still do that. We can still be in each other's lives. But it is a choice to do that. To do this, you need to invite people into your life, to be with people, to spend time with them. And it is a conscious choice. And I know, I know this is hard. I know there'll be people sitting here at the moment going, that's just too hard. I don't have space in my life to invite people into it. And I get that. But honestly, it is what we read in the Bible. <laughs> I can't say it any other way. It's what happens in the Bible. People live life together and Jesus speaks to them. And they sharpen each other. And Elijah and Elijah, people happen. <laughs> people invest into each other. They sharpen each other. They speak into each other's lives. And people who are wanting to hear from God are spoken into. And as we, it's, it's as much about what's being, what, what is modeled as it is as what's being said. It's life on life. And Communities are key for this. Intergenerational, different stages of faith, that's what we try and do at this church. Seeing how we live life together and then speaking into each other's lives. And this is the next picture, please. This is just of my community, the community that I'm part of. I don't, I, I kind of lead it, but I don't. I just go and I spend time with people around a table we eat some food together. Different people cook food together. They're, what I love on this picture is, not Vicky doing that silly face at the back, but um, is Bethany there at the bottom right, my daughter. I love the fact that she gets to sit around a table of people who would, none of them would say they're all sorted with God. None of them would say they're, they're all doing all right, but she gets to sit with people of different ages and she gets to hear what God is doing in life. And we just do the simple, what's God, what's the sunshine in your life? What's the good thing in your life? What's the thing that you're struggling with that you need prayer for? That's what we do. That's it. It's nothing, it's not rocket science. We open up our home. Yes, that, that is a choice. And then we sit around the table and we just be real and honest with each other. That's what it means to be community. It's nothing big. It's nothing big deal. And I do, I do, and I understand that opening up homes is 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 not easy. But look what God does in those places. Those are the places where people get to pray for each other and get to hear what's going on in people's lives. And I would encourage you to really ask the question: How can I be someone who maybe creates that space? Or how can I make sure that I get into one of those spaces? But it will take a choice. To do that, you have to stop doing something else. What does it mean to be like Elisha? Just very quickly, the next thing is exactly the same. He listens and he obeys. He's obviously someone who is really close to God. So when Elijah comes to him and says, I'm passing this on, he's prepared to go and he's prepared to follow. And he is willing to let go. He get, he's obviously 
quite rich. He's got 12 oxen. He's plowing the field, and he burns it all, and it's symbolic of him choosing to move on into this next stage of life. Sometimes God will do that to us through people. He'll invite us into a new stage of life. He was willing to hear God's voice, and he was willing to let go. He publicly celebrated his his calling. It's a little bit like baptism, isn't it? When we come to faith and we celebrate it in baptism, there's a cost to it, to do this in front of people. But he needed to do this to be able to start the next stage of his life, to step into the shoes that he was being given. So I suggest that to walk in Elijah's shoes or Elisha's shoes needs a willingness to let go, to leave behind, to be prepared to change and to step into something new to choose not to do something in order to do the God thing. So what might that be for you today? Think about yourself, how you've grown into being a follower of Jesus. Think about the people who opened up their lives to you to enable you to be a follower of Jesus. Think of how people were Elijah to you. The time that they gave to you the hospitality they gave to you. There are many people in this church who already do this because they understand that this is how God grows us. Maybe that you do already do this. There are people who open up their lives leading God's gangs for our, young, our children in midweek, gathering our children weekly, youth groups, children's groups. They open up their homes. They spend time with people in coffee shops. They commit to being at Connect Cafe every week, meeting people so that they can be Elijah's to the Elisha's and sometimes find themselves being Elisha's when they didn't expect it because God uses people to speak into our lives. My son, Matthew, he's in Birmingham, he's at a church in Birmingham, he gets to grow in his faith because someone at his church chooses to give up his time and have coffee with him occasionally speak into his life. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that people choose not to go and whatever they could have done otherwise, but choose to spend time with Matthew, my son, and invest into his life and disciple him. It takes a choice, doesn't it? But I'm so thankful. What are you called to do? How will you be like Elijah? Prepared to look to Jesus, despite all that is going on, and listen to and obey the voice of God and invest into the lives of others. What is God saying to you this morning? And how will you be like Elijah, prepared to humble yourself, to give up time to be with people who you can learn from and be discipled by? And what I would say is if you want to know more about communities, if you want to know more about ways that you can be involved so you can invest in people or you can be invested in, please do chat to me. Please do look at the welcome table over there where there's information about how you can be involved. But I just want to pause now because God will be saying different things to different ones of us. But let me say, every one of us is here. I've said this before. If you are here at this church, you are not here to be a passenger. You're not here to be a passenger. You will not get anything, well, you won't get the fullness of what God wants for you if you just think it's about coming to church on a Sunday and receiving. That is part of it. But you're called to be part of this community. God has brought you with the gifts that you have to speak into the lives of others. And God has brought other people into this community for you, for him to speak through them to you. Let's just pause. Father God, we thank you for the story of um, Elijah. Thank you for the example of his life and how he, despite many things that came against him, 
was willing to listen to you and to obey. And perhaps one of the biggest challenges for him to step away from what he knew in order to allow you to work in the life of Elisha, to do something different. And I pray for each one of us this morning, Lord, that we would have the humility of heart to come before you and to say, Lord, what are you saying to us? And we offer ourselves to you, Lord, to be Elijah, to inhabit the shoes of Elijah, to be people who look for ways that we can invest into the lives of others. And we offer ourselves, Lord, to be people who inhabit the shoes of Elisha. To humble ourselves. and To recognize our need of you. And that you often use our fellow followers of Jesus to do that. Father, help us to become all that you are calling us to be as your children. Amen.